but I didn't really view money as the tool that it is. And then I stayed with Luke in, in this, uh, this Airbnb for like a month in, in, in Mexico. And we just, we were just going to, going to town masterminding and just figuring out like, what are the next steps? Like how I'm going to do this. And then eventually I built an agency, uh, and long story short, a year and a half after I decided that I wasn't going to be a freelancer, uh, had over a hundred employees already broke seven figures. What is up guys? Welcome back to a new episode of the stick talk podcast. We're here with Zach Schubert who probably has the most impressive resume in the agency space out of anyone we've ever interviewed on this show. So you're going to want to walk in and listen to all the gems that you're about to drop. So welcome to the show, bro. Thank you. Really appreciate you guys having me out. Absolutely, dude. It's cool. Like you guys are here in Tampa in this Airbnb doing a bunch of content and podcasts and you're having an event here later. So it's going to be uh, some good stuff happening today. So we're going to go all over with today's episode. We're going to cover biohacking, lead gen strategies, how you all got started, um, motivation, all that sort of stuff. So going back to like entrepreneurship in general, how did you make your first dollar online? Yeah. So my story is, I think it's, it's slightly different than a lot of people growing up. Um, grew up in a Christian home, uh, raised with some pretty important values. And one of the th important things for me always and one of my biggest passions growing up was like helping people especially uh, working in third world countries. So I would travel a lot. I live, I'm from California, so grew up in California. I would travel a lot to Mexico, uh, help out, build houses, different things like that. And I always grew up with those, those kind of values and that kind of passion. And so the biggest thing for me was like, man, I wanna, this is what I wanna do. Like I wanna learn Spanish and I wanna, and I wanna work in nonprofits and I wanna help people and I wanna do this and that. And that's what I kind of, I feel like that was kind of un my unique approach to life that was different for most than most people because most people are just like, I wanna graduate high school and then I wanna to go to college somewhere and then I wanna get a job or whatever. I was like, I wanna to move to South America. So when I was 17, I moved to South America. Oh wow. Uh, moved to Argentina, I lived there for about five years. Um, and kind of my, my, my goal obviously was to learn Spanish. Um, that's actually where I met Luke when he was like 15 years old. I was 17. Luke Belmar? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, because okay. uh, he's from there. Um, so I actually moved to his this small little town, and he happened to live in the same small little town. Um, like literally small. When I say small town, like everyone knows each other. Small that's town. cool. Um, so it's like a huge coincidence out of nowhere. Um, and that was my big goal in life was to build my own nonprofit. Well, actually, it wasn't to build it then. It was to 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 be in a nonprofit that I could just work and volunteer in. Um, long story short, there's just kind of a lot of different frustrations of I'm as a, as, as an entrepreneur, I, I don't like to be told what to do. I don't like, I like to work my own hours. I, I like to do things how I want to do things and working for nonprofits is very similar to working for a business, right? Like you have a boss, he tells you what to do, when to do it, how you do it. And it's just like, I'm like, man, this, this isn't the best way to help people. Like this isn't the best way to, to have an impact. And I was just like, this isn't right. So then I would, I would move to a different nonprofit and then the same situation. And then one of the things with nonprofits as well is that um, the donor motivates and manages a lot of what goes on. I have a huge passion for South America. Like that's, that's where one of my, my passion lies. And there's this one nonprofit that I worked for for about three months only. And that's all it lasted because I went to the director of South America and I was like, Hey, this is what my vision is. This is what I want to do. And he's like, wow, that's fantastic. He's like, you should find somewhere else to go. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, Wait a second. didn't you like my idea? Isn't this your job? Like to do it? He's like, yeah, but people don't donate to South America here. And I was just sitting there. I was like, okay. He's like, so maybe you should do your own thing or find someone else. And I was just sitting there like I was, I was young still. And I was like scratching my head. I was like, well, this isn't what you normally get told when you're hired to come do this. Um, so then that's where I went back to South America, moved to Peru, uh, was still was making, I still had no money, still was making no money, um, was living based off of just like some things that I earned here and there on the internet doing online jobs. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what, what am I going to do? Uh, went to work at a school for a while because I'm really passionate about children education. So I worked at a school for a while just to see how to do it. And I was like, okay, well, maybe this is it. Maybe I'll just work at a school in South America somewhere. And then I was like, nah, waking up at 6 a.m. and coming to a school and then <laughs> teaching kids for, I was like, no, nah, this isn't it either. So uh, long story short, I have a lot of, a lot of frustration and just like hitting a bunch of walls where I was like, I, I know what I want to do. I know what it looks like. Um, but there's nowhere that I'm able to do it. I just entered this like 
mode of like trying to build my own business. So I actually built this business in, and this is where I guess I made my first online dollar, even though it was kind of in person, I built a delivery system for barbers. And so it was during the time of like the Venezuelan crisis. And so a lot of Venezuelans were coming to Peru and I wanted to be able to help them out, give them a job. So I built this, Venezuelans are very good barbers. So I built this uh, delivery barber system where it's like Uber, but you'd order your barber to your house. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, obviously, because it was the first business, so it absolutely crashed and burned. Um, and then during that time of just like complete frustration, I entered this hard time of like depression, which I feel like a lot of, a lot of maybe not a lot, but a f quite a few people that I've talked to in the entrepreneur game like kind of enter of like, I don't know what to do now. Nothing's working. Everything that I tried to do just fails. And for me, it was never a depression of like I was suicidal. It was always like a, I have no motivation to do anything. I just don't want to get out of bed. Um, I'll just sit here and binge, Nick, binge Netflix for, for whatever. Um, but I also know that I'm not like going to kill myself because I know that I have like a bigger calling. I know that I have, I want to impact people. I know that I want to help people. Um, and I know that I have something to offer to the world. And one of the biggest philosophies that I've learned is in the past few years is that it's very, very selfish not to be your best self and to work in the best way possible because not in like some egotistical, like, Oh, I'm a huge, great person or whatever. But like with the work that you can do and the talents that you have been given, you can impact a lot of people. Yeah. Right. And so it is very, very selfish not to work to your fullest capacity. So that was my th thought. Then I was like, okay, I'm, I, I'm not like suicidal. So I'm going to get out of this eventually, but I just had no idea what to do. Um, so then I actually made a mistake and I was like, I'm going to go back to something safe. I'll just go back to the nonprofit that I was working for in Argentina. I know all the people there. I was there for five years, whatever. Uh, COVID hit. Literally moved all of my stuff, including my dog, to Argentina. I went back to Peru to sell my apartment to get the last few things. The day that my flight was laying, that was literally flying out was the day every single airport in the world was closed. Oof. The same exact day. And I was had already sold my apartment, so I was stuck with a bunch of friends in this two-bedroom apartment. And there was like six of us all that got stuck there in a two-bedroom apartment. And I was like, okay, well, this has to be a sign. Like, there, <laughs> There's not a bigger sign on the planet. Um, and so I was like, okay, well maybe, the, maybe the approach that I should be doing is like freelancing online, right? Like I, I already, I was, uh, following Luke obviously cause we were good friends and, and I was like, well, he's doing something online. Maybe I'll just find something that I could do online. And then just, I guess randomly, like throughout my research, I just like found SEO and I was like, okay, well maybe, maybe SEO is the, the thing that I go for. And then just throughout COVID, I was just able to study wasted a lot of time don't get me wrong because i had no idea what i was doing like wasting time on building a website when really you just need a client you don't need a website like making sure my logo is perfect making like all the stupid stuff that you shouldn't worry about at the beginning of a business um but uh long story short i went into freelancing and i was like okay i'll i'll just freelance on like upwork and fiverr and stuff and make some money on here and then once the borders open back up again and everything opens then i'll go to this nonprofit and i'll be able to make my own money instead of having to rely on donors and i can do whatever i want to and it all sounded perfect and pretty and everything but then one of the things that i realized immediately well one I hated servicing clients. It was, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I hated managing all of it. I hated everything operations I hated. And I was like, well, this isn't going to work because that's all that a freelancer does, right? Like they basically, they basically do both jobs. Um, and then the second thing that I realized is that my time leverage was like super, super low. And Luke actually helped me, helped me realize that is that like, Hey bro, if you're going to work half the day and then do stuff half the day, like you're limited to the amount that you can do. And not only that, but you're limited the amount of money that you have to be actually able to do that. So your, your reach is going to be limited based on how much you're making. And so he's like, why wouldn't you just leverage other people instead? So then you can go and multiply what you're able to do. And that's what kind of when, when it hit. And that's when, uh, and I actually, this was happening. We were talking about this um, at his very first mastermind in, in Mexico. A lot of people don't know, but his first mastermind was in, in Mexico like two and a half years ago. Um, that's where I met all the guys last night at dinner, Luke, uh, Don, who actually came later, Anthony, um, but we've known each other for a long time, but there was just 11 of us at the first masterminds. So we were all like super, super close tight, quarters. Huh? Like they were, these were our boys. Like we, we were there for a week. Um, 
And he was just like, he's like, you're ma- you're wasting your time. And I was kind of anti-capitalist then. I was like, money's stupid. Like, yeah. there's there's no point. Like, we should just help people. It was just like this weird mindset of like, I only want to help people, and that's it. Like, money's dumb. It has no use. Like, it's it just corrupts you. Whatever. Do you think a lot of that came from like the growing up Christian? No, a lot of it came from just my my mentality of like of living in a third world country and seeing. Mm how little people have and how much they still are able to enjoy life. Yeah. Right. Like if you, li- if you've ever lived in a yeah. third world country, like people have the greatest and they're the happiest and they live in little shacks in the middle of nowhere. And you're like, how are they happy? They don't have anything. And then you realize that that's not what it's all about. And then when you think about like, even like helping people and, and working in, in whatever it is, building wells, building houses, children education programs, you're just like, wow, this is actually fulfilling and this is actually happy. So I had in my mind, I was like, well, people that have nothing, they're happier than me. And when you're actually doing this helping for people that don't have anything, you feel better than when you're actually making money, yeah. right? So then you're just like, so then I was just had this mentality of like, well, that's all I'm gonna do then, right? And that's, that's where my philosophy was incorrect because I didn't view money as the tool that it is. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that. But I didn't really view money as the tool that it is. And then I stayed with Luke in, in this, uh, this Airbnb for like a month in, in, in Mexico. And we, just, we were just going to, going to town masterminding and just figuring out like what are the next steps, like how I'm going to do this. And then eventually I built an agency. Uh, and long story short, a year and a half after... I decided that I wasn't going to be a freelancer. I uh, had over 100 employees, already broke seven figures, um, and was on the, on the back end where we were able to help tons of nonprofits with their marketing and marketing education. And then now I'm actually in the process of uh, raising money to actually build the nonprofit that I want to build the correct way. Amazing, wow. bro. So in a year and a half, you said over 100 employees and breaking the seven figures, Mark. Mm-hmm. In a year and a half. Yeah. Wow. And that was with like basically your first agency because before you were just a freelancer. My, my yep, first business basically. <laughs> That's crazy, dude. Yeah. There's so much we could go into there. Um, bro, like what happened at the mastermind? What, what was the biggest takeaway? Like how do you go from having no agency experience to basically hitting a home run on the first swing? Yeah, I mean, I went into the mastermind optimistic and like thinking that I was, it was this, this mentality of like, oh, I'm different than these people too. Like I, I have a higher calling than these people because they're just out here to make money, whatever. And then I was also getting out of some serious drug addiction. So I did, uh, when I was in Peru for that time and during COVID, like I was deep into, when I was in depression, did a lot of hard drugs, uh, crazy in debt. Cause I would do these, uh, I'm not going to tell people online how to do it because then they'll do it. But I would basically, I finagled a ton of money out of, uh, Wells Fargo and other banks and stuff like that. Jeez. Um, which I then out of good conscience, paid off later, but, um, like over, over $40,000 just completely pulled out completely free. Um, won't tell you how to do it, but, uh, just, I had gone into this thinking like, like this is, this is bottom. Like I've, I got out of drugs, like I wanted to start doing this stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, this is the bottom. I'm just going with an open mind and figuring out what to do. And I knew that, uh, that a lot of these guys knew how to build business. And I think that it's important when you go into business to have the correct mentality of why you're going into business. Because if you don't know, then you're going to fail pretty quickly. And money isn't a reason. Money is never a reason. Buying stuff is never a reason. Like you always have to have something bigger than that and have have a clear north like it can be something even as simple as i want to retire my parents or i just want to have a quality life or whatever but but in the end money is a tool so i went into into the mastermind knowing okay well money is a tool it's not something that i can possess it's something that i'm supposed to make in order to to have some form of impact or to or to for me it was having some form of impact or to or to have some form of mission um, so I was like, okay, well, I'm going into this, just figuring out how I can make the most, right? And then that's kind of where, where the where the path led. And then since I knew Luke from early, early on, um, he we just spent some good time together, hanging out and just figuring stuff out for me, which was obviously out of the goodness of his heart. It's amazing, dude. It's amazing, and that's like a very biblical principle too, of like what you're talking about, of like you're here for the purpose of serving others, not to be served. And I feel like that for you, you, maybe I'm wrong, but that's like a competitive advantage when you go into business. I think 
being people centric is, is a competitive advantage. Cause I think most people go into business of like, man, I need to close deals today or, uh, my numbers are going down. I need to get them up again, or I need to hire more people or, and both the operation side of a business and like the, the lead gen and sales side of a business is all about people, right? Like the idea of building a service, the idea of selling a product is to provide or fulfill a need of someone, right? Like even if I'm selling a hairbrush, someone needs to brush their hair, right? Like everything in business is about people. So understanding that and really understanding what that means to the core of what it means to actually and intentionally help people is a lot of thing is something that a lot of people miss. They approach it and they're like, okay, well, this is something maybe that I would need, or this would be, this would be good. Or and that's one of the reasons that I never got into drop shipping because I was like, well, this isn't a product where I feel like I'd be providing the best fulfillment of someone's need to them. So that was always my philosophy as of how can I provide and fulfill and help someone with one of the needs that they have in the best way that I possibly can. And then it's the same thing with your team. Like when you're bringing people on and you're hiring them, like you are fulfilling a need that they have, which is yep. money providing for their family. And oftentimes it's more than that. And people miss that. It's also feeling fulfilled in their life. It's also feeling like they belong to something, feeling like they belong to a tribe. And so when you're dealing with growing a team and building out a company and hiring people, you, instead of looking for the guy that's the best closer, looking for the guy that's the best closer, but that identifies with your mission, your culture vision, fit. and is a culture fit, and that you see that you can invest in, and that you can see that is actually a good fit. Like, I don't want to hire anyone that I don't want to hang out with type thing, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it has to make sense and align with me in that way as well. And I feel like if you view business and life in general into thinking that like people are the center of it, no matter what, and helping people is the best way to get anywhere, then you're able to take that approach into when you're developing product. Like, is this me just doing something that's easy, that I can fulfill easily, that has high profit margins, and that gets somewhat of a result? Or is it actually the best thing for this person and I'm over-delivering, which everyone says, but I'm over-delivering on this and actually giving them something that if I was in their place, I would want that. Yeah. That's the best litmus test. It's like, would I buy this myself or would I use this myself? Yeah. So. Dude, the thing I'm struggling to wrap my head around is hiring 100 people in a year and a half <laughs> while never having <laughs> management experience or never hiring people beforehand. What was the biggest growing pain there? Uh, so my first year uh, was a lot of testing. Um, not only testing with like health and stuff, but also just testing kind of like the business model that I wanted to have, what I wanted it to look like. And I think the approach that I took differently um, just based on having gone to a high level mastermind with people that had tons of money and I literally spent my last dollar to get to it. Uh, I was, had the mindset of like, of like, I was able to see their outcome of like where they landed. And I had saw, seen a lot of people that had sold their agencies for like crazy money, but then their like health was completely deteriorated. They were balding, they were having issues, they were overweight. Uh, they couldn't touch their, like basic things. They couldn't touch their toes. They couldn't have kids because of not sleeping and pulling all-nighters and stuff. So like for me, I was like, okay, well, I don't want to have that outcome. So how do I solve that now before I get to that problem? And then the same thing in business. It was like I saw all these people with all these growing pains, like you were saying, like they had to shut down because they didn't have enough employees or they had to shut down because they didn't get enough clients or or whatever, like their systems broke down. So I was able to kind of identify successful people and kind of like ask them their questions of like, okay, well, what didn't work out? And then do a ton of testing and figure those things out beforehand so that when I actually encountered them, I'd be like, oh yeah, I already know the answer to this thing. Like this is, I've already tested this and this is how it works at a small scale. Um, so that was one of the big things for me is I spent an entire year of just testing, like just trying to run it up myself um, trying to, one of the big things that I knew that I needed also was a partner. And I think especially in the agency space, you have to work with a partner in most businesses, but in the agency space, you have to work with a partner because one of you is going to be good at lead gen and sales and marketing. And the other one's going to be good operations. at operations, yeah. but the operations is not going to be good at the other one. And the other one's not going to be good at the other one because you're just going to be, if you, if you can do it, sure, that's great, but you're going to be unhappy. And you're both of those things are just it. like a black box. Like you could, never stop improving lead gen and sales. Like there's always something that you can optimize. Same thing with 
operation. So like you literally can't be at your best unless one person is dedicated to each just because there's never ending improvement that can happen in both. 100%. So I spent that first year also looking for that. Yeah. Failed with like three different partners. And then finally, uh, January of last year is when I signed my partner, my current partner. And that's actually when we went from uh, 20 to 100 employees in eight months when I actually found the right partner. Yeah, it's huge. That's like literally the number one piece of advice that I have as well for agency owners is like find a business partner. Because like, for that's just what worked for me. Like you were saying, like you see how people around you are successful, like they all have business partners. Mm -hmm. And so like, just get a business partner, yeah. right? It's like success leaves clues. <laughs> and I always like looked at like, even like big people, like or everyone's like, oh, I want the whole pot though. And I was like, if you look at like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, like none of them own more than 10% of any of their companies because no. they realize like, I can't do it by myself, you know? And you don't yeah. need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that thought generally just comes from a scarcity mindset in the first place. Yeah. 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 You said you were going all into biohacking. You told us some stuff off camera. That was pretty insane. Um, but what's your day-to-day -day like in terms of work versus working out, nutrition, sleep, that kind of stuff? How do you balance that? Uh, I'm not very structured. Really? I don't like structure. So that's one of the things that I realized very quickly as well is that I don't like structure and I don't like routines and I don't like habits. Um, not necessarily habits, but I like good habits and I don't like bad habits. But I don't like living to a structure. That's one of the reasons that I went into being coming an entrepreneur is that I wanted to do things how I wanted to do them when I wanted to do them. I mean, it sounds kind of selfish, but there's a way to do it correctly. So it's not like I wake up at this time, I go to sleep at this time, I eat this at this time, I don't do this, I do that and whatever. Like there's not really a structure to I have to my day. I kind of am able to, I've matured enough in the way um, emotionally and intellectually where I'm able to be like, okay, well, this is something that I should do now and I'm want to do it now, so I'm going to do it. Um, and I think it does take some discipline in order to get to that level, like in order to be like, oh, I need to exercise and I want to exercise right now. You need to probably go to the gym and exercise for 30 days straight and then see the results and realize that it's good and get the habit of it. Um, and I think that's what I was able to establish is like, I don't have like a time that I wake up. Um, like there is certain foods that I, that I avoid and things that I do eat. I mentioned to you guys that I, I kind of, I'm slightly carnivore, uh, semi raw paleo. Um, so there is some diet diet. I don't call them restrictions. There's, it's also kind of just the food that I like to eat too. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like in reality, it's like the, I never grew up with like drinking soda or eating candy. Like my parents were like super strict on like, if you, we buy a cereal for breakfast, it's under five grams of sugar. Like, so I, I grew up that way too, of like not liking that stuff. So like, even in high school, I like tried soda and I was like, this isn't good. Like yeah. I didn't grow up on this. So it was never like for me cutting out crap either. It was more of just through that year, the key word that I, that I was focusing on was optimization. Right. And if I'm my tool, if I'm the one in this business, I need to be able to optimize myself at the highest form that I possibly can so that I can have the highest output that I possibly can. And a big impact of that is your gut, uh, because your gut is your second brain. And because you need your brain to be functioning at the highest level possible. So if your gut isn't optimized, your brain's going to be screwed up, right? And so that I knew that if I was optimized 100%, I could outperform anyone. Damn. So paleo for the audience, if people don't know, that's pretty much anything that's natural, right? Like fruits, nuts, uh, any so I don't, type of I meat. I don't do really nuts. So that's that's why it's kind of a, it's a, it's a weird mix. So I don't really do any nuts, don't really do any, any vegetables. Okay. Um, I mainly just eat like meats, uh, fruits, honey, uh, maple syrup. Um, no dairy? Lots of raw dairy, only okay. raw. raw so, dairy, yep. And then, and raw eggs, uh, some raw meat, some cooked meat, uh, bison, venison. Um, oh, bison's the best, I eat that uh, every day. Wild now. boar. I don't eat pork, don't eat chicken, don't eat turkey. Um, so why no chicken? Uh, I, I don't like what chickens do with their lives. So the thing that you think about food. <laughs> Scared birds. <laughs> then we, we were at dinner one time with our, our buddy, uh, Nick Rogers, who you guys all know. Uh, <laughs> he always says this. I think we ordered chicken. He's like, you just ordered chicken? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Psst. weak bird. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I mean, that's how I look at it. I yeah. kind of look at it too, is that like, you have to think about food as energy, right? So yeah. there is some pleasure in food. Like you can have a mean tomahawk like we had last night and it's delicious, right? 
but um, I, I think of food as once again an optimization. So if I'm, if what, whatever my input is, that is also my output. So if I'm looking for food, which is if you calories, another word for calories or kcal is energy. So if you're looking at the food that you're consuming, you're consuming that animal or that thing's energy, right? So that's when you're eating uh, animals that were abused, animals that were treated poorly, uh, whatever it is that you're consuming, that is the energy that you're also consuming. If you're consuming an animal that was given a bunch of anti antibiotics and hormones and whatever, and, and they're in this tiny cell their entire life and they can't move around, like that is the energy that you are consuming. That's why I don't eat pork, because they're lazy. Um, what about shrimp? It's, well, shrimp are, I like shrimp because they taste good, but they're bottom feeders, right? Yeah. But they're also grinders. <laughs> right? I want to be a grinder. I'm going to eat some shrimp. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're, they work hard, right? Like they're not. And then chickens, the thing that I have with chicken is like, yeah, they're just, they're just scared animals <laughs> and they're just like, I don't know, they're mangy. And, and then also the diet that I kind of go after is very, very high fat. So I eat pretty much the same amount of fat that I do in, of protein a day. So I eat about 150 grams of protein and 150 grams of fat a day. And I do that by like eating butter, beef tallow, and I eat it literally eat like sticks of butter. Damn. Yeah. Just as like a snack. So well, yeah, how people yeah. eat it's like trees. a banana, basically. Yeah, straight up. Oh, man. It's insane. It's delicious. <laughs> that, the raw eggs, I don't know. I don't know if I could do this, man. How long did it take you to get used to that? Because I know you said you, you always ate healthy, but that's, that's different. So I've done everything. So that year that I was optimizing for about six months of those um, with the Belmar Bros, we went vegan for that entire year. So we've, I've literally been to both spectrums of the map. So you're eating and I've been in the, the middle. energy of just vegetables all day. What'd you, just what'd you turn How was veganism? Um, it was, it was good because it was my first approach. And I think the issue that people have with diets is one, they're like, oh, this diet's the one that works for me because it gives me the best energy. And the reality is it gives you the best energy because you cut out all the crap. So yeah. like for me, it was like my first lifestyle change. And I was like, okay, well, this is good. But it's really, it was me the first time that I was intentional about a diet, intentional about changing something, intentional about being a certain way. Um, so then I was like, wow, this feels great. But really, I was kind of low energy, wasn't super great for me personally. Uh, the reason that I backed away from animals was also the fact that um, in the U.S. especially, not as much in Europe, but in the U.S. especially, the way that we treat animals is just horrible. So for me, it's not necessarily like a humanitarian thing. Like I don't like how they treat them. It's like a, if you're treating an animal horribly and then I'm consuming that animal, that's the energy that I'm receiving when I eat it. Um, so I was like, I don't want that same energy. So that's why now I am very, very selective with the food that I do eat with whatever I drink. I'm very selective with it just because it needs to have been treated properly for its life. Not in humanitarian, like foo foo, a tree hugger, but like, because it's the energy that I <laughs> yeah, need. Yeah. What about are your thoughts you, on stimulants like caffeine, nicotine? I don't like anything addictive. So I don't okay. do, I don't mess with anything that has any form of addiction to it because I don't think that addiction is natural. Um, I don't think that humans should be addicted to anything. And I think as uh, a man or a human in general or a woman, I don't think being at the will of a substance or being at the will of something is being optimized either. Right. Like, I don't think that it's the best thing to do if something's dictating how I feel, if something's dictating the decisions that I make, then it's not the right thing for me. With that being said, can you pass me the neural lens? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Also, we got to talk about this thing right here. This because is like the Tesseract from the Avengers. Yeah. So yeah, when we were at dinner, I thought it was like a candle Infinity light bomb. lamp or something. <laughs> and I was like, OK, little, what's, little, what's like this? A, like a bong? No, no, it's a, um, <laughs> it hydrogenates water. Uh, so this is something that uh, Gary Brecka and uh, Colin Yersesen set me up with. Um, basically what you do is you just, I only drink spring water. So um, you put, I put spring water in it. You press this little button and then it bubbles up like this. There's just a little bit of water in it. But basically it just puts hydrogen into the water. So water is H2O, right? But most humans are hydrogen deficient. And hydrogen is really good with like, uh, blood circulation, helping you with your digestion, different things like that. So it basically just gives you the hydrogen you need. And I drink one of these a day ish, if I do, uh, and that's all the water that I ever drink. Why? Why is that? Like, is there is a specific hydrated? amount that you should have? Because it's like not a lot of water in there, right? Well, right now, yeah. It's but not like a lot even of water. the full thing, it's like that's like a glass of water. It's like yeah. that right there. Your water for the day. All the water you drink for an entire day. Yeah, because I get most of my water from the the food. Uh, the fruits, and then I drink 
uh, fresh pressed juice, and that's about it. So what's the idea behind this? Like the hydrogen is you just well that makes the, you more hydrated? because of the it uh, because of the the hydrogen depletion in a lot of our bodies. I got it. So and most humans don't have the right amount. About eighty percent, I think, is the statistic. That eight percent of people don't get the right amount of hydrogen. Does it taste different? Or? No, it's the same. Same. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just don't drink water in general unless it's in this form, just because this machine can only take water. If it would take something else, I'd use it. Is there a downside to drinking too much water? In my opinion, so I think a lot of things in, in nutrition is, is one, it's, it's personal, right? So I think everyone's different. Everyone's made up differently. Uh, so I think that there's not like a one size fits all. I think that's where a lot of like social media gets it wrong of like, you shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't eat that. You can't eat this. This is horrible for you. I'm mean, like, there are certain things like the, the standards, like yeah. junk food. But I think um, it's all about optimizing it for you. Um, water specifically for me is not the most hydrating liquid. Uh, it's missing all the electrolytes and it kind of just flushes out your system. So, and it ruins, it messes with your stomach acids as well, which helps you with digestion because it dilutes them. Um, so for me, water is not something that I want to spend time consuming um, because it doesn't help, ha it doesn't give me the result that I want, which is hydration, which is uh, uh, circulation, which is, which is the energy to my brain, all these different things. So when you're consuming like, so sometimes if, I'll, if I actually just have plain water, I'll put salt in it, so I'll drink salt water, um, or I'll, but mostly I just drink f fruits, pressed fruits or eat the fruit and then also from like eating raw eggs and raw meat and stuff like that I'll get I'll get a good amount of my uh hydration from as well damn yeah. very cool I want to pivot back to like the agency game yeah because let's do it. obviously we have an agency a lot of our audience has agencies so you you talked a little bit off camera about like the zero to 30k like yeah. what does that look like or what did that look like for you at least so the way that I teach people how to do it now um and this is the way that I started out and wouldn't change it is um, there's there's two different methods that I have for for basically starting off from zero. I'm not the guy that likes to say go do a free trial or sell it for cheaper or do it for free for case studies. Like in my in my mind, thinking in, in a business point of view, as someone that would hire someone like that, I would hire them because I feel like I was getting a good deal, not that I valued your service. And that's the wrong foot going into business. And the reason for that is, is because if you get a referral from that person, they're based, the message that they're giving to that person is, yeah, they're, they're good, they're adequate for the price that I'm paying them, they're just starting off, they're brand new, so you should get them for less, right? So then you have this momentum of like, I'm being hired by a bunch of these people for a lower rate because, because I undersold myself basically. Like you being in sales, you know that you can't be like, oh yeah, this is our first one, so we'll do it for cheaper because then that just ruins your reputation forever. In no, sales. no, we didn't really do much free work either. Like the way that we would do it, pitch and cold email. It's like, well, how do I know that this works? If you guys are starting out and you know we're up here, you're down here, I would just be like, well, we got you on the call. <laughs> so yeah. we just use the mechanism that we were selling in order to get people on the phone. But you're saying, so right off the bat, you you want to maintain margins. You want to have like this price point, like. Right I, off the bat, you want to have you want to you want to make money, right? And right off the bat, you want to position yourself as the best person possible. And for me, I knew like I I got one freelancing client, managed them for about a week, and immediately decided that I hated it. Huh. So I've never actually done the work for any of my clients ever, like never touched anything, um, because I just didn't like it. And I knew that if I was going to do business, like I was going into business to do things that I wanted to do mostly. Like I, I have the philosophy of I'm not necessarily a person like, oh, let's just grind, just grind it out and then eventually you'll get to what you want. I'm like, you know what, from day one, I'm going to do whatever I want, right? And that's how I'm going to get to where I want to get. Um, and whatever I don't want to do, I'm just going to be smart about it and find someone that does want to do it. So I would literally go on to Upwork and I would look for someone that did SEO services that, that was hired it out as a freelancer. And since um, I had a US account, or if you have a Europe account or whatever, you can find someone in either in a third world country that you can do like the translating or the middleman for, and they like do it for a thousand a month or whatever. And then I would go out, find someone on Upwork, once again, that was looking for SEO services, used all of their case studies, because they're the ones doing the work, used all of their case studies and said, hey, this is the work that I do, I charge 2000 a month. 
And, this, and these are the results that I've had. And you're literally just a middleman. Damn. And then that is how I grew my service. And I never needed to go beg for case studies because every worker that I brought on or every person that I brought on at the beginning had was studies. a freelancer with case studies. And I knew that they had the work. I knew that they had the reputation. And I was able to repurpose those, put my branding on it and be like, hey, these, this is the work that we've been able to do for yeah, people. Because that's always the question of like, hey, if I don't have case studies, how can I charge somebody yeah. right off the bat? There's no proof that it works. And usually the answer is like, either you do that, right? You leverage uh, somebody else's labor who has case studies or you do like heavily performance-based work or you throw a big risk reversal guarantee on there. How did the offer mature from, hey, I have a guy who'll do it for a thousand, I'm charging 2000 to where it's at now or has it not matured that much? So the, the offer obviously is, is constantly evolving and changing because yeah. it just, it just has to, but as far as like the team management and how all that works on the, the, the back end, my, my partner did that because I hired someone that was good at operations and then they are the ones that basically transformed the, the back end of it to actually make it a, an actual operation rather than like the Up middle work. manning that I was doing, uh, the middle manning type thing that I was doing, like actually hiring people, actually training people, think whatever. Um, and then we had our own case studies already. So that's when we were able to take that money, that cash that we had made from like the middle manning and then actually make it into something that was a business. A business, internal, um, build your team. Right. Um, so that's, that's one of the methods that I recommend to people as well. The other method that I recommend uh, or that I, that I also did was um, going through and doing cold Instagram DMs. Mm. Um, and I do it different than every DM that you guys probably get every single day of like oh hey i saw your content it's really good do you want me to do your video editing for you or like liked post <laughs> yeah. like post like post i'm like oh this motherfucker like eight of my posts yeah. in the last three seconds there's yeah. definitely a DM. he's selling something for me. <laughs> yeah. it's the worst um but it, we would go in and we would just we were looking for e-com brands right because we would do seo for e-com brands and we would just uh send a message we would reply to stories we wouldn't just send a random dm and we would always um do something that would like spark a conversation with them like for example, if they were, it was like them showing a story of like a photo shoot that they were having. Like, oh sick, what'd you guys do this photo shoot for? Whatever, and then we would start a conversation and build rapport with them. We would never make it seem like we wanted to buy their product because we didn't want to be, uh, I didn't Bait want to switch. have that, I didn't want to have that like deceptive mentality entering into a relationship with someone. Um, and it was all coming from my personal Instagram. Um, so we would always just like, like, Oh, how long have you been in business for? What is, what are the things that you're struggling with? Whatever. And then what we would do is we'd offer them a free audit. So we'd like, Hey, we're doing these free audits for people where we're going through their entire business. We're telling them what they need to do, how they need to change it. We give them the tools. We give them, we give you everything for free. You have to give nothing. The reason we're doing this is because I make money from my marketing agency. So I'm able to do this to be able to help business owners out. Right. And then we'd get them on a call we would run through like the most valuable thing that they've ever seen in their life. It would literally be an hour to an hour and a half call, walking through absolutely everything personalized for them. And then at the end of the call, 80% of the people would be like, well, how much do you charge for this? Because you establish yourself as the authority by telling them what they were doing wrong, what they need, and then you gave them the solution. You told them what they needed to fix and how they could fix it. And then you showed them that you were the solution because you were the one who told them how to do it. Um, and then they already know that you have a marketing agency because you told them in the, in the, in the appointment setting. So that's the process that I went through, uh, after I left the, the Upwork. And basically what I did is I, I formed my Instagram as kind of a landing page. I hate organic content. I hate doing reels, TikTok, TikToks, whatever. Like I'm really bad at short form and I hate it. Uh, it's just not my, my passion, not my interest. So the way that I, I tried to do it for like a year. Uh, and it just didn't, wasn't my thing, didn't like doing it. So then what I teach people to do is make their, if they don't want to do content, content is fantastic, but if they don't want to do content, make their Instagram as a landing page of like literally having like each square or each post be something about you. Like this is my business, this is my partner, this is what we do, this is our service. So then it's literally as if they're going onto your website and seeing a landing page where they can get all the information. Okay. Hmm. So then when someone clicks on your profile, that's all the information that they can see about you. And then rather than like a bunch of random clips and posts of like you with your dog. Um, yeah. And then what I would, what I did is I hired appointment setters at commission that I would just pay them for the, all the appointments that they set. Cause I didn't want to do the appointment setting. So that's something that anyone can do from zero is like, Hey, this is how many DMS you need to send out a day. This is what, you, this is how you need to do it. And I'm only paying you commission based on how many deals that you sell. 
yep. right? or how many calls that you set. So they would set up the audit, you would do the audit, and then that person would get paid only if the audit closes? No, they, I would pay them no matter what, okay. right? Because that's how you have to do it from zero. You can't just, you can, especially if you're learning how to close for the first time or whatever. Yeah, yeah you're going like, to miss out on yeah, a lot you're of gonna the like, deals. You're going to get a horrible appointment setter or they're just not going to stick around for very yeah. long. Yeah. Um, and then I only did audits for a short time too because I quickly discovered that I didn't want to be on calls. <laughs> yeah. So then I hired someone to do the audits for me. Um, so one of the philosophies that I have in life and one of the things that I do every single month is I actually sit down and I write down all the things that I do on a regular basis. Not like the one-off things like, oh, I had to go do this and I had to go do this. But I sit down and I say, okay, these, this is what I do on a regular basis, either every single day or every single week. Okay, and then I na put a put a title to that job or or assign it to someone or whatever. And then I go on on LinkedIn, on Upwork, on whatever, and I see how much it costs an hour to actually get that job done. And if it's less than what I make, I hire that person. Huh. So you're hiring like how many people a month at this point? I don't I don't know. I don't have a number for that. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd be lying to you. I have no idea. That's yeah. super cool because I feel like the the natural like inkling is, hey, I'll just hire people for stuff I don't enjoy. It sounds like you hire people for everything. Well, because I don't enjoy working. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. So you're just like, I'll hire everybody for everything until I'm, la I'm really lazy. I can't afford yeah. to. Exactly. That's smart. And, I, and I'm like, okay, if this costs more than me, then okay, I'll, I'll bite the bullet and I'll keep doing it. But so what's the less management than me, look like on that? Like, are you managing these people or where, like, where do they go? Yeah, well, I have, I will, now there's quite an ecosystem built out of managers and people that are actually doing the, doing the hiring and managing and stuff. So that's, that's been beneficial, but yes, obviously I still have my pulse and it's not that I don't work, just what I enjoy doing is finding new things to do, right? Like I am, I am, I get stir crazy and I don't like to do the same thing over and over again. So like if my job can be finding what needs to be done next and then being able to assign it to someone and then finding what needs to be done and then figuring out how to do it and then teaching someone how to do it and then moving on to something else. Like that's my ideal situation because then I'm doing something different all the time. And it's yeah. a, it's like a churn for me of like, Ooh, I'm learning something new. And then I learned how to do it. And then I taught someone, I'm like, Ooh, now, now I get, now I get to find out what, what next, what needs to be done next in the business. And that's what a lot of people that don't have real businesses don't have time to do because they're not actually a CEO of their business. They're just another employee of it. Yep. Right. Where I actually get to look at a high level and be like, okay, well, where do we need to go next? Well, we need more of this. Great. Let me go figure out how to do that. I'll come up with a solution. I'll bring it back to you guys and then I'll show you how to do it. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly how the business grows is by like the evolution of bringing yeah. in new people and changing up the offer. And if and you're the one doing the work, you're not going to be able to see where to go next. You can't see where to go next and you can't spend time even doing it. Yeah. yeah. So zero to 30 K you do either the uh, like reselling Upwork services or yeah. you do the uh, appointment setting through Instagram DMs. Last night we were at dinner, the tomahawk steak, that was pretty dope. Um, but you were telling us how you spend like $2 million a year yeah. on Instagram ads. Yeah. So like when does paid traffic come into the play for your, your agency? So I started personally at like 30K and once again, it was, um, I feel like I did things, not backwards, but I did things sooner just because once again, out of, the, out of the desire not to have to do the same mundane task over and over again. So I got really tired of the audits. I got really tired of doing the, all the, the, the cold DMs and everything. So I was like, okay, well, how can we just have this come into us? Um, so that's when we started exploring ads. Um, and we actually started exploring with like, just like boosting our stories of like posting a Shopify screenshot because we were looking for e-com brand owners and be like, hey, this is what we did with SEO. If you want this, send us a DM. And we started just boosting those and we were like, well, let's just see if this works. And then I actually went to go work with uh, one of my friends, Paul Neff, um, and to, do, to do ads. And we started making some like, some like short form content to post his ads of me talking about what we do and whatever. And I was like, man, I really don't like doing this. So that was my, my, that was my first thing when I pretty much knew that it wasn't going to work for my company. And the second thing is it would depend on me, right? Yeah. Like I would be the have to one recording the ads. I would have to be the one uh, making the content. I would have to be doing all these things in order for the business to grow. And that's not a business if it relies on you. Um, so I thought, okay, well, this isn't going to work. We have to figure out something else. Well, I was like, well, these things, these posts that we're doing on Instagram occasionally where we're just posting these stories, they're working. Like we get people sending us messages. So what if we just run these as ads? 
So what we so what our ad strategy is and has been for the last year and a half and has not changed is we literally just grab Shopify screenshots and you can do this for any niche. If you if you're looking for leads, you can do it of like I don't know like your your instantly account of like showing what you what you got or you can do it of like your your go high level of like how many you closed whatever it is, and you can show a screenshot of it something that your target audience would recognize and then we just overlay the Instagram text editor on it. And the reason that we do that is because we only run DM ads and we only run them to stories. So we want it to look as native as it possibly can so that people don't just click through it because they think it's an ad, right? So if it looks like a story and they're just scrolling through, they're like, oh yeah, and then they read it. And then swipe up and respond to it, and then And then they swipe up and respond. And it's like a DM set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's the, the process that we go through um, because everyone, the thing about Shopify owners is our hook is literally just the screenshot. Because anyone that has, is on Shopify, it every morning they're looking at their dashboard, right? And even some of our ads say like, hey, your dashboard doesn't look like this. This <laughs> is what I like, different things like that. And one of our highest performing ads, like literally the copy on it says, um, uh, this is one of our clients that did SEO. You'll spend, uh, your, you'll spend your life savings on Facebook ads for, for a terrible ROAS and give all your money to Zuckerberg, but you won't spend a few <laughs> a few thousand a month on SEO and get a 35x return like this in like this client. Send us a DM, and that ad that ad with that copy has literally made me more than a million dollars with wow. just a with just a Shopify screenshot. Damn, that's huge, dude. Wow, yeah, it's insane. So paid is how you really scale things. And then yeah, we stopped doing the cold because the leverage was just different, yeah. right? Um, for LinkedIn, we actually do the, the audit method, but for, for Instagram, we stopped doing the cold um, because the leverage was just different. I was like, okay, if we're spending this much money and this much time on ads, then we can scale faster than if we're spending this much money and this much time on audits. Um, so then we just pumped all the money into write that. that down, bro. That creative was such a good idea. Have you, uh, <laughs> That's how you know it's good when one of the hosts is like, hold on. It's like, write that down, write that down. Have you had any issues with the ad platforms? Like, because you're just directly calling out, like, this person made this much money? Nope. Because we don't, we don't, uh, it's in the creative. So we're not saying, like, you'll make millions of dollars. Yeah. We're not saying anything at all. We're giving, because the thing about it, too, is we're targeting business owners that are making at least two million a year. So we're trying to speak their language, too. Yeah. We're not being some like scammy entrepreneur of yeah, like, no, like, get of, rich like scheme. of like oh you can get a Lambo if you do this blah blah or whatever like it's like it's like your ROAS I know is three right like <laughs> I know it because I know what all of your dashboards look like it's yeah. a three and I know that your conversion rate is probably below two percent and then I'm like for SEO all of our conversion rates are between a five and a fifteen percent and then business owners like wait that's what I want. Yeah, and yeah. I feel like the problem a lot of times with ads is it takes you to like a deceptive website or landing page. Yours is just swipe up and let's have a conversation. And the reason that I don't like VSLs is because there's it has too many variation variables, and then it's very uh, it's very cookie cutter, right? So the thing about um, the thing about marketing, and I was talking about this yesterday with with Luke when we were talking about sales with Luke Alexander, um, is that when people come to you with a problem and business owners come to you whether it's uh, B2B or B2C, they think that their problem, people are unique, I, I agree, but they think that their problem is unique and that therefore they need a unique solution tailored to them, right? So the issue with a VSL is you're selling the same solution to everybody's problem when they think that they're unique. When mm -hmm. we as marketers, we know that it's I don't awesome. care who you are, we're gonna do ABC for you and it's gonna work for you every time. Like, like your, your thing might be like your conversion rate's low. It might be that you're, you're not getting a ton of traffic. It might be that you're like your click through rate is low, whatever. But when we onboard you, we're going to do the same checklist. Yeah. You know what? But when you're doing sales, like you're selling to their pain points, you're selling to their emotions, to their problems, to whatever they have, you're not going to sell them something that they don't have an issue with. Yeah. So it's the same thing for me through like advertising. Like why would I advertise to someone in a way that didn't treat them as a unique human. So why, that's why we do DM ads specifically and we don't do any sort of automation. We ha I have four appointment, well probably five now, I think five appointment setters that work on my account 24 seven that literally sit there and respond to the messages where they're just saying like, hey, and then once again, we're doing the same strategy as the, as the, as the audit. We're not just trying to sell them, we're like, well, how's business going? Yeah. Right? Like, well, what are your biggest pain points? Like the setters are doing this before we even getting on a call with them. 
of just like building a rapport with them and they think they're talking to me, like we're not telling them that they are. If they ask, we're like, yeah, I'm a appointment setter. But they think they're talking to me and building a relationship with me ahead of time. So then we're able to build this relationship, see where the business is at, and then like, yeah, actually, I see that you have an issue with conversion rate. This is what we are able to do with people, and this is a case study or whatever. Oh. And then that's where we're able to kind of like bring people in and, and speak to them personally. And then the other side of that, which a lot of people don't know and they don't think about, is when you're spending money, giving money to Facebook to advertise, you are at the will of what they want. And what Facebook wants is for everyone to stay on their platform. So you are going to spend more money if you are spending money to get people and to take them off page. their platform. Because that's what you're doing is you're taking them off yeah. Facebook, you're taking them off Instagram. Same with any platform. If you're running a VSL, you're paying that platform for their traffic. If you're paying for a DM ad, you're going to spend less money because you're keeping them addicted to that platform. Sheesh. It's fire. We got to try that. Too bad Twitter Super doesn't smart. that. Well, they kind of do. You can do the comments. Yeah, I mean, you, you can, can run a Twitter DM ad and just be like, DM me. Why yeah, can't true. the CTA just be a DM? Or you can, uh, what a lot of people do on Instagram as well is, uh, like Richard Yu and a lot of those guys that sell like courses, they'll just, and they'll do like the, the shout outs and the giveaways or whatever. And they'll be like, put in the comments, uh, freedom or whatever. Yeah, mine then, is like email. And then, it, it's, and then you can say, I'll send you a DM. And so you can do that with the ads too. You can say like, comment on the ad and say freedom. Then you'll just have to review it. Have your appointment setters make sure who's commenting and then send them DMs whenever they... That's what we're trying to figure out now is like I have people that just DM me email and I'm like, what do I say? It's just like... How do you turn it into an appointment? I guess because there's always like that awkward like cat and mouse game where you're trying to build like a real relationship. Well, then you I, then when they comment that, you, you say something like, hey, well, would you mind if I send you a DM right now? If they say yes, you DM them and then you start building a relationship with them of like, oh, why do you... Why does this interest you? Yeah. What do you... What's going on with your life? Like different things like that. Got it. Super casual. Yeah. Yeah. It's because that's what it, it's about people, right? Yeah. And that's what people Goes forget. To it. Like, it's not about how many appointments can I get in this day? It's how many people can I help? Right? So if you're thinking about everyone needing that help, you approach the situation of helping them differently. Is there like a CRM that you use? Cause I feel like there's, we use go high level go mainly high because, uh, one of the things that I figured out is that you can connect it with your Instagram. Okay. So it actually links to your Instagram and then you can see the DMs on the platform, mm. which then allows you also to send out, um, like when we have book calls, we'll send out like automatic DMs of like, here are our case studies so that you can check them out for the call. Here's your link for the call. Since the first point of contact was Instagram, we want to use all three point of contacts in Instagram email and SMS to make sure that we're hitting them in all, at all angles. But if they don't get the email or they don't get the SMS and they ignore it, whatever, we want to make sure that we're still on the original point of contact. Huge. Okay. Dude, that's crazy. That's like a very unique way of growing an agency that we haven't heard on this podcast yet. So the audience is probably hype. <laughs> um, as is Christian, he's got it in his nose already. But um, <laughs> one of the questions I have is like, okay, you have the success with the agency. This is the first time we've met. Like the Zach that we know is like an author an influencer like you have a lot of content you're part of capital club you have a coaching program like what was the pivot point for you to say like okay i know what i'm doing now like i'm gonna go show other people how to do it as well um it's a it's a people game right so i don't i don't make my money off the coaching i still make my money off the agency um, and i think that's kind of an important thing to to know as well when you have a program and if you're looking to invest in someone's program like are they making money off that program or are they making money off of doing what they're teaching you um so i i for me, it's all a, it's all a impacting people. And I, like I mentioned at the beginning, I really like education. So there's a, there's an aspect of it as well, where I think that, um, I'm able to give something back that I've been able to learn and it's selfish to hold it back. Mm -hmm. Um, so like the, the coaching program that I launched that I recently partnered with, with Eddie Maloof and Ashton Shanks, um, like it's, it's nothing. We, we charge people a hundred bucks and then we give them hours and hours and hours of content and every single strategy that we've all ever used for our entire lives. So it's, it, we don't make the money off of it. It's all about just helping people and then over delivering because the reality of it is, is one of the most important things that people, cause all the information's out there, right? Like there's, there's no course or there's no coaching program. There's no anything that's not on the internet already. My strategy that I told you, I have it all over my YouTube. Now it's on right? our YouTube channel. Well, it's which on you better be subscribed to. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, put the like graphic it's, in. It's, <laughs> it's everywhere, right? So like, yeah. there's nothing new, right? Like the the thing that that AI is never going to be able to replace is community and original content, right? But there's content already that goes out for free, and community is the only thing that people don't really have access to. And so that's why one of the things that I wanted to do is be able to build a community of agencies, yeah. um, because I also built it because it's what I wish that I had when I first started off. Like I wish that I had a community that had the right information and the right people that I was able to identify with. So I was like, okay, I'm going to create this because it's what two years ago me wishes that I had. Yeah. Dude, it's so cool. We've talked about Eddie a little bit already, but mm -hmm. he's going to be speaking at our mastermind event next month. Very cool. How did you guys get connected? Um, social media. Like yeah. I've never even seen him in real life. <laughs> Ever? <Really>? Nope. <laughs> oh, wow. That's crazy. No, social media, man. It's, uh, how long have you been just, partnered up for? Ne uh, we just started this month. Okay. Like, I've been working with him for and def a couple different projects and things like that, but he had reached out to me a couple months ago. Um, and he's like, he's like, Hey, I want to partner up with you on your community. And I was, he's like, I see that you're doing it the right way. And, and I, and I want to, I want to be a part of it. And I was like, sick, let's do Hell it. Yeah. Why not? And I'm like, I told you, I'm the, I'm the guy that likes to, to, I'd much rather collaborate with 10 people and get 10% than work by myself and get a hundred. Yeah. So that's yeah. sweet, dude. Going back to, uh, I'm sorry. What I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna say like, you, you <laughs> social there? media connections is so weird to think about because people that aren't well versed in the agency, uh -huh. meta, whatever you want to call it, metaverse, <laughs> like, oh, how do you know that kid? I'm like, oh, Twitter. You ever met him? I'm like, nope. But I'm yeah. going to go over to Amsterdam and meet them. I'm yeah. not meeting people in Amsterdam, but most of the cities I've been to, I've been able to meet people in real life, and we feel like we've known each other for five years. Yeah, so. and it's it's just fun, too. Like, I think I think it's the part that I enjoy the most about this and the most about life is just being able to network. And, yeah. like, that's why I came to Tampa is just to – and throwing, throwing a little pop-up with, yeah. with a bunch of people that are going to come out. And it's just like, yeah, I just want to shake some hands and yeah. – have conversations kiss, like this. Kiss some babies. And, you know, <laughs> Wait a second. He's going for president. <laughs> like the politicians. Yeah. Uh, but no, think was, about how this podcast started, right? It was yeah. just like an Instagram DM. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. It's the part that I enjoy of it. Um, and then I also know that it's, it's in the end of the, at the end of the day, like my, my mission is to be able to just to meet more people uh, and help as many people that I, as I can and, and influence them in the way that, that I think is, is in the right way and the only way that you can do that is by kind of knowing people and having the authority to be able to do that yeah and sure. that's just opening the door to so many new opportunities too mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of commonalities here that struck a chord with us like we're all passionate about education i really like what you said about making money with your agency not just like having one good month and then not running an agency anymore and just selling that was one of our most successful to... ads when we started oh, yeah. our coaching. Is like we have a hundred k a month agency. Yeah, it's just good not like a, a coaching program. And then the other thing is that like we've all found good business partners. Obviously, like we're here today. We have our business partner Daniel, uh, cold email wizard for the people out there who you know we love working with. But you mentioned you went through like two or three business partners beforehand. What was the difference when you found that person that you're and able even to guys with? now like with Eddie? Like what makes a good business yeah. partner? Um. Eddie was a no brainer. Yeah. But um, we also align on like quality. Uh, I think that's where, where me and Eddie get on well is that we align with quality. Uh, and with the, the work that we do is, is not just like, hey, we're not just in for this, for the money necessarily. Um, I know that he has like the best out there and that he has a good community and a good following. Um, and for, I mean, frankly, for him to trust me with that community and stuff of like, hey, I'm going to give you all these people and all my people because he only does like high ticket stuff for them, like his mastermind and stuff like that is it's it's humbling. But it's also good to see at the same time of like I'm, I must be doing something right. And and also for my business partner, like that one was just trial and error. Like I the first three just they just didn't have the same drive as me. They didn't have the same mission. They didn't have the same work ethic. They didn't oh, have the lazy, same bro. end desire. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's different, right? No. Because because I have high standards for the people that work for me. I just don't have high standards for myself, I guess. Is <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I was going to say that's an interesting one. <laughs> no, I tell people that I don't work, but I mean, I, I work. I, I work. I just I just do work that I like to you do. You work on the business. You just don't work in the business. I do work that I like to do. And even if it's on the business and I don't like to do it, I don't generally do it. Um, and I think that was one of kind of like the differences that I have with a lot of people too is that like 
it gave me that drive to find people that does like that do like to do it right because if then I, if i'm just the one sitting there i'm like ah man i really hate doing this I, whatever i'll just grind it out but my grind was like i hate doing this i'm going to grind to find someone that likes doing it and does it well so that then i can move on to doing something it's else it's a different type of work yeah makes sense so would you say your biggest strength is leadership um team building my my biggest strength um I think I do have a, a pretty good role at leadership. Um, I think communication is a good one as well. I'm very good at sales as well. Um, but I think the, that at the end of the day, like my, my values and the way that I approach life in general um, is, is what helps set, set me apart and helps... Um, helps people identify with that how would you distill that down i mean you've talked about it a lot on the podcast but like at this point what does that look like that's a tough one <laughs> i mean i i would i would once again i mean it's 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 uh kind of bringing sand to the beach but I, it's just helping people like that's that's what i want to do in life um and it sounds like cliche of like oh look at this goody two shoes, whatever. But like, that's just what I found my pla passion in, what I found like what I like to do. And so whenever I do anything, it's like, okay, well, how can I get closer to this? Like, don't get me wrong. There's, there is, there is fun in making money, being able to travel, rent a big, huge Airbnb. Like there is some, there is a fun aspect to it. Um, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, money is just a tool, right? And a lot of people think that like if they're when they start earning money and when they start getting into business that that they need to like possess it like money, that money's something to possess and and that's the that's when money will start eluding you like if you think of the word money you're going to think of like all its synonyms you can think of like wealth can even be a synonym but currency and is also a synonym and if you think of the word like currency it's like and this is a concept that I learned from Luke is like currency is a current which flows Right. So if you're thinking about something that's constantly flowing and that doesn't stop, and if you try and put a dam in front of water or in front of a current, what happens to it? It stagnates. So it's the same thing with money. Like if you're trying to possess it, it's going to stagnate. It's going to pollute. It's going to have, there's going to be no use to it. So if you're thinking of money as something that's a current of like, oh, okay, I can create this dam and which will then create electricity, which will then power a whole city. Hmm. Then it's then, then all of a sudden, the water is going to keep flowing to you. And so if you're able to position yourself at that stream, at the mouth of it or whatever, and say, I'm going to fill my bucket here, but not fill it to fill it, to keep it, because then that's where your water stagnates, but fill it to actually do something with it, then that's where it abounds. And that, and it can be that, it can be different for every single person. And you just have to be able to want it enough. And it has to be something that you truly want. And that's where a lot of people mess up is they're like, I want a Lambo. And then they make enough money and then they buy a Lambo and they're like, well, my money's now stagnated, not because it's in, a, in an asset, but it's stagnated because I got the car and I realized that it's not all it's cooked up to be. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, I'm tired of this car after a month now and it's just like every other one and now I want a Bugatti, right? Yeah. So it's that, it's that grind of like finding something that's bigger than yourself where you can leave a lasting impression on people, because that's what I think life is about, is, is people. Uh, leave a lasting impression on people, however it might be. And it can be selling an incredible product. I'm not saying that you need to go build wells in Africa. Like it can be selling an incredible product that impacts people's lives and change their lives, right? Like it can be something that, it can be a service that teaches students how to, students in high school how to make really good money, right? Like all of those things are impacting and create life long change for people you just have to figure out which one it is for you and then create your money making machine so that it then feeds that so for you obviously biggest investment is people right like from a business perspective like where else does your cash flow into that you've seen nice returns from as far as like investments just in general like how do you use 
money essentially like as a tool outside of just hiring people obviously health is probably one big health category. is a huge one because it's once again every input is has an has an equal output so you're looking for things that uh, are going to have a positive input on you and that are going to create that the output that you want right so experiences obviously is a huge thing for me so i've traveled yeah. a ton like i've been to don't know how many countries but over 30 for sure over 30 mm -hmm. that's it, what i was saying last night yeah <laughs> right I, how old are you 29 Yes, that's a lot. Yeah, more 30 countries before than 30. Your age. I don't think that's <laughs> that many, honestly. It's not. Yeah. No. Mr. World. It might be more than uh, that. I don't actually know. I've been to really. most of Europe, most of South America. The only continent I'm missing is, is Africa. Well, in middle, you said the Middle East. Depends too, right? if you believe on in an article. You haven't oh, been boy. to the Middle East. We won't East get into whole. that, bro. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in birds? Do I believe in birds? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, all the time I see them. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you don't think they're government drones? No, no. Okay. You ever been to Costa Rica? I have been to Costa Rica. I, I there. lived it's there so for cool. a while. Dominical, Uvita yeah. area. It's so fun. Cool. I love Costa Rica. Favorite country in the world? Croatia right now. Nice. Yeah. Why? It's like a movie. It's crazy. Water's super clear. Uh, the f I'm a big foodie, so that's what I spend a good amount of my money on too. I've, I'm, I'm a Michelin guy, so I've been a ton to a ton of Michelin restaurants. You said no, last time, like no, every dinner cool. is like over five hundred dollars at this point. Well, that's California. That's just because California is stupid <laughs> expensive. That's different. You go out and buy a taco, and it's like five hundred dollars, please. You're like what? And they flip, and they flip the screen. It's like eighty percent tip. <laughs> and, then, and then it's like you flip it over, and it's like yeah, tips also forty dollars. It's included though, so you don't have to give it extra. <laughs> it's like and I hate you. <laughs> and I hate and you. I want you to leave, and I'm going to charge you more taxes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, no. Uh, uh, so yeah, I like to, I like to eat really good food. So when I travel, I also that's like. I'm not a big like tours. Are you a Paul Saladino bring gr ground beef on the plane kind of guy? I'll bring eggs, oh, but, nice. but not ground beef. No. <laughs> but the food in Croatia, what's what's good about it? Like so the food in Croatia, they have a huge Italian influence. Uh, they're a brand new country too, so it's also relatively cheap to go there. Um, but they're they have a huge Italian influence, and it's right on the Mediterranean, and so Beautiful. it's kind of like a mixture of like Italian and Greek food. So mm. it's like the best pizza and pasta, and then the best seafood that you'll ever get. So it's a really good mixture of like Mediterranean Damn. and Italian food. That's and they've got beautiful beaches too, right? Bro, it's like like the pictures that you see in like Bali and Thailand or whatever, where you just see to the bottom, you see the fishes swimming around. That's what it is. Damn. And it's the the best beaches, the best weather. Um, the, they have really cool architecture. Like if you go to like Dubrovnik, like where the Game of Thrones and everything was filmed, um, like really cool architecture. So cool. Um, and then it's just, a, it's island life, right? So they're known for having like thousands of islands. So you'll just go out to an island and then you like rent a, rent a yacht or you can go on like one of the public ones that's like five bucks and you just go around a bunch of different islands <laughs> or you can rent a yacht for the day and then just visit like six islands that day and just see like create like crazy there's this thing called blue caves which literally looks, looks like there's light inside of a cave and it's like blue lights all over the cave and there's just like crazy nature stuff it looks like a movie wow yeah and you're getting married out there i think you said right yeah that's yeah. gonna be Sweet. Yeah, it'll be fun. That's why. That's why we had originally went out there is to look for Scoping wedding out. venues. Yeah, that was um, the first time you went out. Or that was the first time I had oh, gone right? out. Yeah, my fiance had already gone, but it was the first time that I. Do you gone feel out. like that that's could be a place cool. you like move to? That is one of the ones that we are considering uh, between there and and Portugal. Portugal. Portugal's the best. Yeah. We're going to Portugal in one two months. November. Yeah. Yeah, we went there last year. Super cool place. What Lisbon. area did you say you got to go? Because we were in Lisbon. I've never been. But you, what was the area you liked there? In Portugal? Yeah. I've never been. Oh, you've never been? No. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, no. You like Porto. Place is sick. The wine? Is that the wine? Like where all the wineries are? I think? That was like where like, I think Oliver was comparing it to like the Beverly Hills of Portugal. Oh, right, right, right. The seafood that I had there was phenomenal. Yeah, too. It's, it's, it's like we, we went to this one place where there's no roads. So they don't have, you don't get around with cars. You get around with boats. Like they, you, they would take us from the hotel to the restaurant in mm. a boat. <laughs> and then you'd like sit in this restaurant that was like also basically on the water. Fisherman comes up with like what he caught, throws it on the table. And he's like, this is your guys' dinner tonight. Yep. I'm going to go cook it up for you. Which side of the fish do you want? Like literally. Wow. And it's just the craziest thing. That's how um, they do it in Lebanon. It's so yeah. fresh, bro. Because the, there's fishermen like at the restaurant that are just working right outside the <laughs> restaurant, like catching the fish and then bringing it. He's like, yo, where's my sandwich? He's like, I'm trying, bro. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> I'm only getting sea bass. <laughs> like, that's literally what they're doing. Yeah. It's amazing. It's the freshest seafood. But yeah, that's I, so I like I like spending on traveling uh, experiences. I think is is great. Uh, Education is huge one. Networking events like 
Capital Club has been a, a good investment for me that I've that I that I continuously do. Um, and then I like good food and then and my team, yeah. But those are the things that I enjoy personally. Like I'm not a big material person of like buying fancy watches or fancy cars. Like I, I drive a car that I bought three thousand dollars cash and it's like a nineteen ninety nine Mercedes. So <laughs> I, I, those aren't things that interest me. Um, the it's only thing nice watch. it was a gift from Luke oh, nice. actually. Dang. So I've I've never I've never bought a watch either. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, bro. So what? Talk a little bit about uh, Capital Club and what you're doing there. Yeah. So uh, for Capital Club, um, when this is aired, it'll probably be launched already. It's getting uh, it's airing the 22nd of September. Um, that's when the platform is being launched. On the platform, it'll be. Uh, I'll give a, a few short details. It'll be an education platform with a bunch of different courses for pretty much every single niche, as well as a community for every single niche, right? So there'll be a, a section for e -com. There'll be a section for agencies. There'll be a section for... Um, Crypto, probably, stuff like that. <laughs> We're good. We got visitors. We'll keep it rolling. Uh, there'll be a section for pretty much every single niche on the planet. And so I'm the agency partner for it. So my community, I've actually been building in preparation for the Capital Club launch because once it launches, we will be completely integrated into the uh, the Capital Club ecosystem. And then my coaching system will be outside of it, right? So the um, what it's going to be is going to, what's consist of is like live streams. Um, so one of the things that I do in my community is I bring community experts like that's why I'm recording this weekend with with Daniel is for cold email is we just bring in experts did one yesterday with Luke Alexander where we just bring in the experts in the specific niches and then I do live streams with them because one of the things that I'm very aware of is that I don't have the, all the answers and I don't know everything so I'm I like to bring the experts in each niche so that they can bring the best answers for what I think is their problem right so that's why I picked Daniel because I think he's one of the best in, or you guys are one of the best in cold he is email. The cold email wizard. He is, yeah. <laughs> he is, so that's one of the things that I like to do is, is bringing those in. So that'll be inside of capital club. Um, and then we have some good mentors, obviously from people that are on my team. I don't hire my mentors from my community of like, these were successful people. One of the reasons for that is because if, if you're a successful agency owner, you're probably making pretty good money and you don't yeah. want to be a mentor. Um, but I hire from my team that I have trained and that know my processes and, and then they're able to come into the community and teach it to people. And that's like the coaching side specifically. Um, but then capital club is just going to have hundreds of hours of content of just every single niche podcasts, private interviews, uh, with some of the biggest names in the industry. Uh, and it'll just be a good time. And then they have a higher ticket, which is what I've been a part of for the past three years, which they have, they do events sometimes twice a year, sometimes once a year, it's about 15 K to get in. Um, and there we do them in like random isolated places in the world that are very hard to get to. Very cool. And when you say they, it's like Luke, like that's his, that's his so, business. So Luke is the, is the founder. The CEO is Steve Tan. And then the CEO is uh, Evan Tan. So they're all business Tan, partners. You said T -A -N? Yeah, Tan. Yeah. So the Tan bros, they're, they're OG drop shippers like 200 million, they had like a million dollar a day. They're just like, wow. like they own the warehouses where the products were shipped out of, like they were. That's sweet. Uh, they're out of Singapore. Um, but yeah, they're they're his business partners. Um, but yeah, they're the ones that are running the Capital Club show right now. Very cool, dude. You got so much going on. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting, dude. What else, man? What else? I got a nerdy agency question because we were talking about this right before the podcast started, but one of the knocks on the agency model is like, Hey, you're, you're just not going to be able to exit it. And oh, yeah. you were saying you've yeah. helped people go through that transition of not only like zero to 30 K, but all the way up until an exit. What does a successful exit look like for an agency? So, uh, I'm going to address the first part of like, it depends what your, your end goal is, right? Yeah. Like for me, I could have exited my agency a long time ago. Um, the reason that I keep it is because when you're building an agency, it's very different than when you're building an e-commerce brand or when you're building a coaching program um, because you're creating this huge and elaborate ecosystem. Um, so for me, I saw it as an asset that I was building, whereas some people are like, I'm building this as something that I want to sell. For me, it's an asset that I want to use for the rest of my life, 
right? Because now, whenever I want to start a business, I have my team do it, and I can just be like, hey, can you go organize this for me? And I already know that they're going to do it, right? Because I've trained them. They already know all my processes. They already know how to do it. So any business that I want to start, I can start. The, the community, my agency community, ironically enough, which is how I make most of my decisions, don't, take, don't do this, I don't recommend it. But I actually decided that I was going to start at three, uh, like a week before I actually started it. It wasn't something that I had in the works. But then I, was just, I just told my team, I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I want it to involve. I want all these guest speakers. I have a pretty good network, so I was able to bring in, I was able to bring in like 40 guest speakers like the first month. Um, I want all these guest speakers confirmed before we even launch so that people can, so that I tag all them on Instagram and they can all, all their traffic can come in into my community. And we launched it within like a week just because I had the people to do it. This meetup here this weekend, I decided that I was going to do it three days before I came <laughs> here. Like I just, I just messaged Daniel. He's like, yeah, I'm in Tampa. I was like, oh, sick. I haven't done a meetup in Florida yet. And so I was like, let's just do a meetup. And then I had my team find a place, uh, secure all the people that were going to come do podcasts here today, uh, and then send out invites to everyone and we got over like 50 people signing up in 12 hours so i was like okay sick let's let's just do it and then flew out here so like for me it's an asset to be able to use to do something else and that's also something that i'm learning heavily from eddie because obviously eddie could have exited his agency for years ago for millions yeah. and millions of but dollars it's almost like you have this team of high performers and you can just leverage your labor for whatever you want to do for whatever that i want to do if some people they want to exit for the money that's fine they can do that the the idea of the idea of exiting that i've that i've been learning is that you kind of just have one you have to create something that functions without you right so if you're the if you're an employee inside your business then it's not going to function without you right so if if you're taken out of the equation will the business still perform well um, my business will still perform at the same level the seo side but i want to use it for other things too so that's why i haven't personally um, but that's one of the principles is making sure that if you're taken out of the business will it still function at the same level and will it be able to continue to grow yeah um, one of the other things that you have to look at um, is your is your lifetime gross profit your LTGP, which is basic is is different than your LTV because your LTV just shows you your lifetime value of a client, right? So if my lifetime value of a client is let's say it's thirty thousand yeah. um, dollars, that's fantastic. But you know what? If your LTGP is zero, then it's useless. And that bas basically um, what you're trying to do is eliminate all the costs for your service. And so let's say it costs me twenty thousand bucks. Or sorry, let's say it costs me, yeah, 20, we'll say just say 20,000. Let's say it costs me $20,000 to fulfill those $30,000 that that person's paying me. So then that means my LTGP is 10,000. So that's what I have left. After, after I've paid all my employees, after I've paid my overhead from, that, from one client. Um, so when I'm looking at that number, and then I have to look at how much does it cost me to actually get a client. And if the amount that it costs me to get a client is less than three times. So if it's two times, meaning if it, meaning if it costs me $5,000 to get a client, then that's not a good thing for someone that's looking at your agency to scale it. Yeah. So generally when you're looking at the cost of acquiring a client, you have to make sure that you're comparing your, your, your cost per acquiring a client, your CAC, with your LTGP. And it has to be three times or more of it, right? So if it costs me $1,000 to acquire a client, then my LTGP has to be 3,000 or more. Mm. If that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. I like that a lot. So with the people that you have seen successfully go through the process of exiting an agency, what type of multiple would you say is like solid or industry standard at the moment? I've seen people exit for 15. I've seen them exit for, for an agency. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Especially back in the day, like uh, one, of the, one of the guest speakers that we have, his name is Josh Johnson. He's a big ops guy. He exited his uh, agency for around that um, for around that amount, but it was about four years ago. Um, and then I've seen people just that have really crazy agencies exit for a lot more. Uh, I met this one guy who exited his business for over a hundred million, right? So if you're creating an asset that actually functions and can grow, someone that can see someone like, for example, like myself that understands that a marketing agency can be an asset, and it's not just like, oh, how many clients do you have? Yeah. Oh, can you fulfill them? But like if you have like a mean, lean machine that actually can function and build businesses, then anyone that's built a high level, high leverage business is willing to put down the big bucks to come in and be like, yes, I like your team, right? Okay. Like it's different for e-com. Like you're paying for the product, you're paying for the customers and the data that you have. For e-com, it's like you're, I mean, for, for agencies, you're basically paying for the team and yeah, some of the clients that they have, right? 
the but it's basically the for operations. the team. Yeah. Because then you're able to come in and be like, actually, I have a great program. I'd love to use your team to build out this program, you know, or I have a better product than you do. And I'd love to use your team for something better which is what I'm in the process of doing now is I just acquired an Amazon agency a month ago mm. um, is finding offers to use with my team because I know that my team were good at selling SEO, which is the hardest thing on the planet, in my opinion, to sell. Yeah. So I know that anything that I bring to my team, it'd be like a cakewalk for them. So I'm, we always look for new things that we can sell, new offers that we can sell, new things that we can do because every time we bring it in, we know that all of our systems work they're all proven and it's a cakewalk for them because they've done much harder. Um, so we're all, but, and then we're also in the, I'm in the game of taking shortcuts now. So I don't want to build an agency from zero. So I just found an agency that didn't have great systems that didn't have any, that wasn't good at lead gen. And I knew that we are good at lead gen. And then so why that fit. agency? Cause they, they weren't good at lead gen. They, they had only, they had service tons of clients, but they had, they only grew from word of mouth. Gotcha. So they still had the impressive case studies. And Very impressive numbers. case studies. Gotcha. Really good team. Excellent results. Millions of dollars made in revenue for their for their clients. Um, but they just had no idea how to position themselves. And then they had no idea how to scale further. Right. So like there's a lot of things that break in agencies once you get past the 100K mark. So, yeah, it's, it's something that uh, with you and Eddie, I think it's super interesting just because the amount of people who I've hopped on a sales call with agencies, they're like, yeah, like we've just grown through word of mouth and referral. Yeah. Like that's it. Like there are hundreds of those businesses. So because like people don't think agency is an exitable business, I feel like a lot of people are overlooking the opportunity out there to acquire agencies if you do know how to do outbound lead gen and marketing. So yeah, I mean, in my, my opinion too, it is my opinion and it's biased, but I also think that agency is like the easiest place to start because especially if you use my strategy of like just going on to Upwork, there is no risk involved. If the client, if the, if the, client does not sign and they don't pay you, you don't owe anyone money because you just told the guy, like, I'm going to go try and find people for you. Right. So there is no risk to it in, at all. And then it's just, it's a lot of money that you can make for very little, like for, yeah. for e-com, you're selling a product that maybe you make 10 bucks from profit every one. So you're gonna have to sell thousands of them. I can make a thousand from just one deal. Right. So it's, it's a different ball game too, for me. So I've always been a fan of, the agency model for people that are like, oh, what do I do with my life? Agency is the easiest way to go, in my opinion. It's the easiest. Yeah. It's yeah. an interesting balance, though, because a lot of agency owners, they get into it for that reason, the low overhead. Mm -hmm. But then they become so risk averse that they're just constantly swimming in that like five to 10K a month range. You do have to change that mentality. Yeah. Because yeah. the beginning is like, yeah, sure, avoid risk because you need to pay the bills and you need to keep your lights on. But, um, once As, you prove it out, once you prove it down. out, once you, you need have to some invest cash in education, in, bank, in my like, opinion, like you need to education and then what, and then advertising. That's yeah. where, that's the where team. our pivotal, that's where our pivotal point came. Another reason for that scaling of a hundred of 30 to a hundred employees within that year was not only because I, I added on my partner, but also because we started doing paid ads. And then that's you where handle like the, you needed the team because the traffic was there. Yep. Well, yeah, because we figured out how to do it. I didn't know how to do it before. So once I figured out this method, that's when everything completely took off yep. um, because then everything was just flowing. Right. Everything was coming in. High volume. <sighs> Masterclass, dude. Because it costs us about uh, $10 to receive a message. Costs us about $1,000 to close a client. Um, our packages are 3000 to 27,000. We require three month contracts. So we at least have people for nine to, uh, 90,000 every single close. And it costs us a thousand, a thousand to close a client. And it costs us about, uh, 2000 on the, at the lowest to fulfill it. So that's a, if you look at those numbers, that's a 7,000 LGTP, which is your lifetime gross profit. And then it costs us a thousand to acquire a client. So we have about a seven X on our ads. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. So you're just going to run them forever, obviously, at that point. Spend as much and as you can. And then you just scale it up. <laughs> yeah. Go crazy. You've done that, too. I love it. Let's uh, jump into the lightning round. All right. Christian's got a, a Europe. You've already seen all the questions. No, uh, we, can, we, got, we got a couple. You know how they're going to go. I'll actually switch it up a little bit. All right. If you had to visit three countries for your last ever trip, what countries would they be? I'd go back to Croatia. Uh, I'd go to Argentina. Um, and then I'll pick a new country. I would go to 
I would go to Antarctica. <laughs> Antarctica. I want to see what's no up. I wonder why you're never coming back. I want to see what's <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, that, that is actually why. Yeah, that's the end. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I mean, I'm still going to ask my same question because I think it's an important one. Um, I guess the question is better asked this way is like on Twitter specifically because it's written. And w- when Twitter had like the character limit, it was like 140 characters. But like if you could put out one last message to your audience, to your team, to your family and friends, like what do you want to leave with them? Um, one of the phrases that my uncle always told me growing up is that um, people matter and only people matter. Um, I am Christian as well, so I would, I would add love God and love people, uh, and it's the only thing that actually matters. And that would be I my last tweet. Powerful. What would you say to your 19-year-old self who is still in the mindset of like, making money is stupid. It doesn't really have any real utility. It's not the point of being here, which obviously you still think is true. Like money is not the goal. It's the goal is to help people. But what would you say to somebody who's kind of still in that like very anti-capitalist mindset as somebody who once was there? Uh, You just need to change your mentality on what money is. If you're thinking that money is the end all get all, then you're going to stick in that mentality. But if you think of it as a tool and the way that I think of it now, um, if I am anti-capitalist, which I am anti-making money for no reason, um, but if you do have that mentality of anti-capitalist, then you have to, then you're missing out on the impact that you can have on people by not making the money that you're able to make, right? So with the work that I do now, um, I am able to have a much bigger impact in the third world countries that we're going to be launching our program in because I was able to invest the money to create the program correctly. I was able to invest in the team that could write the best program on the planet. And then I was able to get all the contacts that I needed in all of those countries to make sure that it was dispersed to everyone. If I was doing it on myself, by myself without money, without connections, without a team, then it would be a lot slower process. So I, once again, view it as a tool for myself of being able to amplify the impact that I, one singular human, can have to many people because I have money. Love that. Very well said. Love it, bro. Good stuff, man. For the audience out there, this was a good one. Um, High impact, lots of things that they can take and and implement. Um, And I'm sure, as always, there's not everything dropped in just one podcast episode yeah. <laughs> and so you have a lot of, i think you're saying you had like 100 videos recorded or 100 hours of videos that you haven't released yet so like a lot of content a lot of value soon, soon. yeah coming soon so like where can our audience find you follow you and, and learn more about what you're up to um i spend the majority of my time inside of my community just chatting with people because that's what i enjoy doing um so it's called the agency domain uh pretty soon i'll also be spending time obviously in the capital club community um uh, and then I post mostly in my stories. I do some some Twitter. Mostly it's my team that's managing it. Um, and then I do YouTube as well, but mainly just the live stream, some of the live streams for my community. Um, but you can find me at Hey Zach Schubert, H E Y Zach Schubert, on Instagram. Same on Twitter. Same on YouTube. Um, but best place to catch me. Like, I literally am the one answering questions inside my community. If you want questions on my Instagram, you won't get me. You'll get my appointment setters. So, um, but those are the best places to kind of see what I'm up to and see see how life's going. Good stuff, bro. Yeah, Appreciate good stuff, bro. I love it, man. Thanks Appreciate for it. This up. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Good stuff, man.